Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us here Dr. Meera Nangyal, an expert on the issues of Indian banking sector. Welcome to News Click, Dr. Nangyal. Hi. Right now there is a crisis of uh, NPAs in the banking sector. In 2015, Dr. Raghuram Rajan has highlighted it. And after that, the uh, RBI has withdrawn the regulatory forbearance because of which the NPAs have been revealed. Till then, they were being hidden under the rubric of different categories. But now, I think about 9% 9, 9 of banking sector loans are NPAs. And Credit Suisse estimates that by 2018, 16 to 7% of the banking sector loans would be NPAs. So can you explain how this uh, NPA crisis has come about? It is no secret that uh, the amount of NPAs has been growing. And uh, with each financial year, like in 2016 to 17 to 18, and by 19, we would have sort of uh, you know resolved the situation so it's like now reaching the peak 2018 is going to be the peak of this NPA crisis you know and when we talk of NPA uh, what we actually mean is that the bank has given a loan to a borrower and the borrower is not repaying that loan either the principal or the interest amount so that is a non-performing asset from the point of view of the uh, bank and uh, what it actually means is that you know over the years the RBI has been coming out with various schemes to resolve this crisis so you know they had a corporate debt restructuring then they had a scheme where they said okay you know for infrastructure loans let the period of the repayment extend to maximum 25 years or they came out with a scheme where they said that the sustainable component where the business has cash flows let that be separated from the unsustainable component or they even said okay that the debt can be converted into equity shares and the bank can change the management of the business of the borrower however all these sort of didn't really work in the manner that the government and the reserve bank were imagining uh, so then there was another level last year in may the uh, Indian Bankruptcy Code was notified uh, in 2016. Okay, and why these schemes have not worked is because, you know, these the crisis is mainly uh, restricted to about 500 accounts and the 30 top borrower groups in India are involved in this whole business of borrowing money. And what has happened is that the same borrower group has taken money from multiple banks. Besides, it would be having other creditors, suppliers of their you know, raw material components. So it's very difficult for all the creditors to agree to a solution. Because the problem is that the borrower is not able to repay the entire amount. So everybody has to accept less. So who accepts how much less? You know, we uh, the technical term used is a haircut. So how much of a haircut, like the, uh, the situation has come to s such a pass that it's almost like you need to go bald. So if your loan was, let's say, 40,000 crores, so the bank is being asked to accept 20,000 crores. And if it was 60,000, take 30,000 crores. So it's like a huge steep decline. So you are not even saying, now you are in that position where you are saying, uh, you know, don't pay the interest, pay interest as a less, at a lesser rate, okay, don't even pay the principal amount, pay a fraction of it. So naturally, the people who have lent the money are not ready to accept that much less, which is the reason why all these schemes have failed in the past. And now what has happened is that on uh, the 4th May of this year, the Reserve Bank of India, the government note brought out an ordinance and this ordinance empowers the Reserve Bank of India to direct the bank to, you know, push for a resolution of a case. That is the bank is being directed that if your loan was 40,000, 20,000 is what you will get and you don't have choice, you have to accept this. So it's like taking away the professional commercial independence of the bank and pushing them for a resolution. 
So, as you said, uh, the Reserve Bank's ordinance forces the banks to take a haircut. So, how will it affect each of them? How will it affect the borrowers? How will it affect the lenders that are the banks? Will it be any, uh, any, in any way beneficial to the banks? <laughs> no, it's not going to be beneficial to the banks at all. The beneficiary, the first beneficiary of course is the borrower. You know, if I take a loan of 45,000 crores, and in the end, I'm told after many years of not making payment that, okay, instead of 45,000 crores, pay 24,000 crores so, or 25,000 crores. So that means 20,000 crores I've saved. That would have been on the debit side of my profit and loss account. That would have been my expense. It would have eaten into my profits. So I have made a killing in that sense. You know, I may be playing victim that I'm making losses. I'm not able to pay the loan back but actually I'm benefiting from it. So any borrower who's able to get the loan amount reduced is making, is a gainer. Then the second gainer is the company who is now bailing out this company, this borrower company. So they are buying assets, maybe factories, at a lesser reduced price. In normal course, that factory would be much more worth much more because if you were to construct the factory from scratch, you would spend money. Now you're only paying the amount of the NPA. So the buyer is also a beneficiary. So Birlas are a beneficiary. An interesting case would be like Bhushan Steel was in talks with uh, GSW, Jindal Steel, <coughs> for a you know 55% share transfer and they would buy the factory. But then it didn't work out. They couldn't manage the deal. And now Bhushan Steel is with the bankruptcy code. It's in the 12 cases. So now under bankruptcy, its assets are going to be sold. So naturally the price will come further, uh, fall down. So now anybody can pick it up at a much lesser price. So uh, we also hear reports in the news of the companies with so-called NPAs who owe money to the banks, their share prices are actually going up. So are they really in that dire straits that they can't pay their loans? <laughs> See that, you know, one would have to do a very thorough analysis. So one wouldn't want to make an irresponsible statement. Huh? But it is true that, uh, you know, because some of these companies have good assets. So, and now because only 12 have been referred for bankruptcy, the others, it means, are for sale. So anybody who buys them will buy them at less than the uh, market price, will have an asset. And when you buy a loss-making company, you can set off the losses against the profits of your existing buyer company. So obviously in the share market, people who are investing in the share market, they are also betting that these companies will now have fresh capital into them, their factories will start running. So they are a good bet. So they are willing to bet on it and rightly so. So they will gain out of it. You know, but what question arises is that, uh, you know, what what is the response of the government or the Reserve Bank? to this crisis. Like if we are saying that banks have ended up making these losses, then what is the accountability of the bank? You know, is somebody questioning them? Why they ended up with this huge amount of loss? Was it error of judgment that they did not have the skills, they did not foresee that these loans would uh, not be recovered? Or it is also true that they were giving loans, uh, they were increasing their exposure to the same borrower group for the same assets. Like 27 banks are lending to the same borrower group for the same asset. So then is that asset worth that much money? Like for example, if I go to buy a house or a car. So if I want to buy a car for 10 lakhs, the bank will only give me 75% of 10 lakhs. And at max, if I'm a very good uh, borrower, you know, I have a stable income coming in or something, they'll give me 90%, always less than the value of the asset. But here the banks have given more than the value of that asset. So then why have they given more than the value of the asset? You know, is it uh, because the corporates were offering them some incentives? You know, are these cases of corruption which have resulted in this? 
or is it because the government wanted them encouraged them to give loans because these industries are important for development in the country if that is the case then these banks are instruments of development of state policy then we can't label a bank as inefficient you know then we can't use the argument public sector banks are inefficient and they should be privatized so then that fails and if they are corrupt then why should they not be punished why should they be given immunity you know that is a question that we should ask thank you for watching newsclick please keep watching us at newsclick.in